You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi guys and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Fast Break Edition podcast. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Today, just going to ha- be having a look at some guys who could be available in your league on the waiver wire who could help you for the coming uh, the weeks ahead and hopefully pushing through to that championship. Looking at some guys whose value has changed a little bit with that trade deadline as well. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. He's up nice and early for a Monday morning. Let's have a look at the first guy, or the first couple of guys, former Chicago Bulls, now members of the Washington Wizards, Punch Bob Shiplock, Bobby Portis, and Jabari Parker. Portis, I think, was a must-roster guy before the trade. I think he still remains that now. Um, we saw him have you know, a strong game in that first one against the Cavs. Maybe not quite as good in the second game against the Bulls, hashtag revenge game. But still, it appears that Portis is going to be getting the bulk of those minutes at center. Thomas Bryant is starting, but Portis is getting the bulk of those minutes behind him there. And then if or when Dwight Howard returns, I think it's Bryant that loses out there, not Portis. So I think that he's a pretty strong add for the rest of the season. You know that you're going to have some efficiency problems at times. Uh, you're going to have a lack of assist and defensive numbers, but the points and rebounds... Uh, will really be helpful there for Portis. As for Jabari, it's not as clear-cut, I don't think, for Jabari Parker. Now, that game against the Bulls was fantastic. He almost triple-doubled in the first game against the Cavs. But there's a couple of things to note with both of those. Against the Cavs, he played 23 minutes, and it was against the Cavs. So, that is Jabari Parker at 23 minutes a must-roster guy when he doesn't have to face the worst team in the NBA in non-Knicks division? That That's a debate. And then the next thing, well, Josh, look how well he played against the Bulls. He played 30 minutes in that game. Yes, Jeff Green played nine minutes in that game because he hurt his hip and wasn't able to return to action. So Jabari got a boost in playing time there. So I don't think we can expect, A, the level of assists that he produced against the Cavs, or B, the level of playing time that he produced against the Bulls. So somewhere... It's like he got the best case scenario for his first two games with things going his way. That might lead to, if you do have Jabari, maybe it's a sell high moment. Maybe someone believes he's a top 70 guy the rest of the way. I clearly don't think that because I do try and look at those factors. Why did he play that much? Why did he put up those numbers? But if he's on the wire, he's absolutely worth grabbing just in case he sticks. Maybe they want to see what he can do over Jeff Green. But if you want to tell me that Jeff Green's not a part of the Wizards' future, then Jabari Parker isn't either because there is zero chance that they're picking up his $20 million team option for next season. And he will be an unrestricted free agent once again, much like Jeff Green will be. So there is you know, that same sort of story, but maybe he, you know, they decline that option and they bring him back at a cheaper deal. That's all possible. So he is worth grabbing, no doubt about it. But when we're looking at those last two games, it's probably the upper or definitely the upper level of what we can expect from him. In Memphis, a couple of guys that uh, you could have gained value there. The one I want to talk about here is Ivan Rabb. He is going to be the starting center moving forward. I don't really agree with that move. I was pretty critical of JB Bickerstaff earlier in the season because he just refused to play Rub. Now they get in Jonas Valanciunas, and he's going to continue to start Rub. Now, I don't think this has a massive impact on Valanciunas. It probably reduces his overall top 40 upside that he could have had if he was a 30-minute-a-night game because last game, Rab was the starting center, and Joachim Noah played 30 minutes. Now, I think that Noah's probably going to be out of the rotation on most nights, and that's exactly what the Grizzlies should be doing and running that Rab Valanciunas front court. But Ivan, for now, I think he's a potential double-double guy with pretty good field goal, or very good field goal percentage, solid enough free throw percentage. I'm um, not going to do much in those defensive stats, but I feel pretty okay about him. Say, if you've got someone like a Thomas Bryant on your roster, that's a pretty easy switch for me to go and grab Rab over. Didn't mean for that to rhyme. Sounds like Dr. Seuss. I'd be more than happy to, to uh, acquire Rab uh, at the expense of Tom Bryant. Let's talk another guy who is very much on everyone's mind at the moment, Kenrick Williams of the New Orleans Pelicans. They are pumping a lot of minutes into Williams at the moment. Last game, uh, Etwan Moore did return after a, a pretty lengthy absence, played only like 15 or 16 minutes and enabling Rab to get, uh, Rab to Williams to get these 36, 37 minutes. I don't think he's going to stick at that level. He's banging in threes at a really, really high rate as well. But I like Williams. I couldn't believe he was undrafted. Um, yeah, liked his, real, his fantasy upside a lot. He's uh, even impressed me. 
and, and yeah, I've talked about him on this show for, you know, for months ago. I started talking about him, you know, seeing if he could get into that rotation ahead of guys like Wes Johnson. I think he's a better player than Etuan Moore. I think he probably will stick in the starting lineup for the rest of the season. I also don't think that 37 minutes a game is probably realistic, but he, to me, is, is a must-roster 12-team league guy. In Dallas, you've got the two big men, Maxi Kleber and Dwighty Powell. I think both of these guys are going to hover around the 80 to 120 range in terms of uh, ranking numbers. Powell is a low, uh, sorry, we'll start with Kleber. Kleber is a low field, lower field goal percentage guy, a nice blocks and threes combination type player. That can be really useful. Powell, on the other hand, is more of a, uh, a blocks and steals and field goal percentage guy, so slightly different stats that they bring. They're both in that overall value range. And again, if you ask me that question, who do I who do I add, Kleber or Powell? It's at this point you have to be looking you have to be looking at your team at every point in the season when you're making a lot of these decisions. But you've got to look at your team. Do you need Kleber's threes? Do you need Powell's field goal percentage? They are big differences. You know, the way I've got projected out, I've got Powell at about fifty eight percent field goals and Kleber at about forty five percent. That's a big difference. And you know, adding one of those guys, Kleber might have more overall value, but it doesn't actually help your team. Powell might have less value, but he does exactly what you need. So both of these guys are in the discussion to be 12-team guys, and they probably should be on a 12-team roster somewhere in your league. It doesn't necessarily mean they both need to be on your roster, or it doesn't mean that any of them need to be on your roster. Well, there's no preference necessarily for each one. They're both in that band that's really, really close together, and it's all going to depend on how it fits your team. A guy that needs to be rostered, of course, is Larry Nance Jr. I can't believe it's taken us to the start of February for Larry Drew to actually realize he needs to play this guy. And the uh, the astonishing confusion that it's taken now for him to start over Zizic as the center or Thompson or whoever it is, I, I cannot believe it's taken this long. He needs to be rostered. I am still, my caution level is dropping with Nance, but I still worry that when Tristan Thompson comes back, he's going to come back, he's going to play him 36 minutes and Nance at 18. Remember that bullshit at the start of the season when Thompson was playing that much and Nance was barely seeing the court. I don't think that's going to happen, but it is still a scary thing to think that maybe that's what they'll do. I want to see this Nance and Love front court. You cannot leave Larry Nance. Now, he's available still in 27% of leagues. He can't be left on any waiver wire. McCall Bridges also really starting to crank it up at the moment. His offense is starting to catch up with his defense. It's not consistent, but the defensive stuff is pretty consistent. He hits threes, he gets steals, he gets blocked. He's a triple one, triple one and a half type of a threat player. And I don't think you should be leaving him on the wire. Yes, Devin Booker's been out and likely to return today. TJ Warren's been out for a while. DeAnthony Melton's been out. But I don't think that uh, Bridges' minutes are going anyway. He shouldn't be sacrificing anything to Tyler Johnson. And if he is, then Kokoshkov should be ashamed of himself. Bridges should be rostered in all 12-team leagues. A couple of Clippers guys we need to talk about. Patrick Beverly, who's on a real solid run at the moment, shooting well, grabbing lots of rebounds. The minutes are there for him. Avery Bradley is gone. Yes, Garrett Temple's in, but they're starting him at small forward, and I think they'll continue to do that for a pretty significant length of time. I think you can't leave Beverly on a waiver wire, much like Shea Gilgis-Alexander, who I think you know, should be getting 30 minutes a night. Whether Doc does that or not remains to be seen, but... Yeah, Shea has uh, got an opportunity now to, to up his minutes or be consistent with his minutes with Beverly out of the picture. And if there's a- any prioritizing of Temple over Gilgis Alexander, again, Doc should be raked over the coal. So I think you need to be looking at Gilgis Alexander as a pretty solid 12-team league guy. On to the big man, or a big man, Mitchell Robinson of the New York Knicks. I think he is the best NBA prospect on this team, as Greg Ehrenberg, TV's Greg Ehrenberg, uh, tweeted that out the other day. I wholeheartedly agree. He's still getting frustratingly low minutes with DeAndre Jordan there, but I can understand playing Jordan over him. But now at least we're getting 20 minutes a night of Robinson, not, again, this bullshit of 16 minutes a night so we can get Lance Thomas and Luke Cornett out there. Robinson's blocking shots. He's getting a high field goal percentage. That might not be what your team needs. But if it does, shit, he brings it to you more than almost anybody, and he needs to be on a roster somewhere. He has got legitimate top 100 upside for the rest of the way. Dorian Finney-Smith of the Dallas Mavericks. He's probably locked in as a starter. I think he's more of a 14-team must-add guy there in Dallas. He's not a guy that's going to be providing great top 100 type value, but I think he can be a top 150 guy the rest of the season, meaning he's probably your 12th or 13th guy on a roster, which can be fine, but it also means that it's not a must-add scenario. But he's absolutely a name who is now in consideration for 12-team leagues with all the Dallas trades that have gone down. The next guy, Ibitza Zubats, a really solid uh, first game for the Clippers there. 
I've, I've talked about how I've, I'm not as high on him as some others who think he's coming in and playing 28 minutes a night because that would mean they have to cut a lot away from Montrez Harrell. But he played more than Marcin Gortat, rightfully so. I like Zubats as a player. I think that he has more consistency now with the Clippers than he did versus the Lakers. Maybe not as much of a 25, 26-minute upside, which we saw him getting occasionally for the Lakers. But he is still you're more of a 14-team league guy with some 12-team appeal if you're looking for those big man type numbers. I'd probably take a Mitchell Robinson over a Zubats at this point because his ability to influence those two categories is higher than what Zubats can do. But he is a guy still, if it's a, who can be a pretty solid 12-team guy on the right team in the right circumstance without being labeled as a must-roster guy. DeLon Wright of the Memphis Grizzlies is a little bit disappointed with how the Grizzlies utilized him in the first game. There, you're starting Avery Bradley over him, which absolutely makes zero sense. Uh, there is still Mike Conley around, of course, so DeLon's not going to be the starting point guard, but he's had tremendous success in Toronto as a two, as a three, and as a one, so he can fill in all those different positions. He should be getting developmental minutes over Bradley and over Justin Holiday. Whether Memphis does that or not remains to be seen, but I think taking a flyer on DeLon, if he can get to 25 or 26, six minutes a night, he could really challenge the top 120. And then if um, there's any injury to Conley or they, or they really unleash Elon and play him 30, 32 minutes a night, then the top 100 is absolutely a possibility. He gets steals, he gets assists, he can hit threes. You have really good free throw shooter as well. I think he is a solid option who's available on quite a few uh, quite a few waiver wires. And the last guy I want to talk about is the new New York, new York Knicks power, starting power forward, Mario Hazonia. I don't know why I called him Hazonia. Hazonia. Um... At the start of the season, I thought the Knicks were going to start with what I thought they should have done, run a lineup of Frank Nilakina, Tim Hardaway, The Fort, Kevin Knox, Mario Hazonia, and Ennis Cantor. But it's taken this long for Hazonia to come in there as that starting forward alongside Kevin Knox after the inexplicable... And by inexplicable, I don't mean that there's no reason for it. It just makes no sense for the benching of Noel Vonley, who played three minutes of one game and then never came back, and then moved to the bench the next game, and of course, played 25 minutes because there's no consistency in what Fisdale does. I don't think there's going to be any consistency in what Hazonia does, but if he can get 26 minutes a night, he can be a consistent enough producer. Uh, in those minutes to be an impact fantasy guy. He's probably at this point more of a 16 or 14 team league ad because I definitely have no confidence in what his role is going to be as we move forward on the Knicks. You shouldn't have any confidence in what his role is going to be. Knicks fans shouldn't have any confidence in what his role is going to be because he's just as likely to be a DMP CD next game than he is to start and play 27 minutes. But his ability to score, hit threes, get steals at a pretty good rate. He's a decent enough distributor on this team as well. I think he is worth looking into and keeping an eye on at least in 12 team leagues and adding in those deep performance. I'm sure there's other guys on waiver wires. I can't cover every single player when I do this shows, but there's some names that stood out to me that could be available in quite a few leagues that could have a real influence on your league for the rest of the season.